As Donald Trump tries to distance himself from Project 2025, Donald Trump's running mate, J.D. Vance, maybe you've heard about him, you know, um, very likable guy. Uh, anyways, he wrote the foreword to the upcoming book of the president of the Heritage Foreword who is leading the effort for Project 2025. Now, the author of said book, Kevin Roberts, also wrote the foreword for Project 2025. And we've talked about it before, but it is deeply authoritarian. In his foreword, he says that uh, porn should be banned and LGBTQ plus people should be designated as porn and free speech rights do not apply to them. And uh, really, really ominous things. But anyways, he has a book coming out. Now, the book has been delayed, so that way it doesn't hurt Trump in the election. But the book was titled Burning Down Washington to Save America. Now, after we know what we know with Project 2025, uh, now they softened it. Now it's taking back Washington to save America. Uh, so <laughs> the book was delayed, but thankfully we actually got access to the foreword that J.D. Vance wrote for Kevin Roberts. Now, we're not going to get the full book. I think it has been released. I believe Media Matters got a copy of it, but I just want to look at this forward to see what J.D. Vance said. I haven't pre-read this. I'm curious if there's like a reference to childless women because he just talks about that all the time. But nonetheless, let's go ahead and uh, and read it. Whether Vance's forward to Dawn's early light survives this dust up is anyone's guess, but here's the text in full. Okay, so... In the classic American film Pulp Fiction, he's starting with Pulp Fiction, interesting choice, John Travolta's character recently returned from Amsterdam, observes that Europe has the same consumer goods as America, but there, it's just a little different. That's how I feel about Kevin Roberts' life. He grew up in a poor family in a corner of the country largely ignored by America's elites, but his corner was in Louisiana and mine in Ohio and Kentucky. Like me, he's a Catholic, but unlike me, he was born into it. His grandparents played an outsized role in his life, just as mine did, and now he works far from where he grew up, just a few steps from my office in Washington, D.C. He is the president of one of Washington's most influential think tanks, and I'm a U.S. senator. So, for all this downplaying, he's admitting here he's the president of one of Washington's most influential think tanks. So the Heritage Foundation, uh, they had the mandate for leadership back in 2016 when he was president. Uh, do you want to know how many policy recommendations he implemented the first time he was president? Take a guess. 25%, 40%. He implemented 64% of the Heritage Foundation's policy recommendations a majority. So why should we expect him to not do the same with regard to Project 2025? So I don't believe him when he feigns ignorance. But nonetheless, let's read more into this forward. Now he has written the book you hold in your hands. Actually, we're reading it on the internet. So uh, haha, which explores many of the themes I focused on in my own work. Oh, does it now? I'm curious to know what these themes are. Yet, he does so profoundly with a readable style that makes accessible its real intellectual rigor. <clears throat> Gay people bad. Very intellectual. Well-researched. Thank you. Never before has a figure with Robert's depth and stature within the American right tried to articulate a genuinely new future for conservatism. The Heritage Foundation isn't some random outpost on Capitol Hill. It is and has been the most influential engine of ideas for Republicans from Ronald Reagan to Donald Trump. Oh, now I see why they delayed this. Because this ties Trump to the Heritage Foundation, which is spearheading Project 2025. Wow. It is Heritage's power and influence that makes it easy to avoid risks. Roberts could collect a nice salary, write decent books, and tell donors what they want to hear. But Roberts believes doing the same old thing could lead to the ruin of our nation. If you've read a lot of conservative books or you think you have a good sense of the conservative movement, I suspect the pages that follow will be surprising, even jarring. Oh, I, I don't disagree there. Roberts understands economics and supports basic free market principles, but he doesn't make it an idol out of decades-old theories. He argues persuasively that the modern financial corporation was almost entirely foreign to the founders 
of our nation. The closest 18th century analog to the modern Apple or Google is the British East India Company, a monstrous hybrid of public and private power that would have made its subjects completely unable to access an American sense of liberty. The idea that our founders meant to make their citizens subjects to this kind of hybrid power is a historical and preposterous. Yet, too many modern conservatives make such an idol out of the market that they ignore this, a private company that can censor speech, influence elections, and work seamlessly with intelligence services and other federal bureaucrats deserves the scrutiny of the right, not its support. Roberts not only gets this at an instinctive level, he can articulate a political vision to engage in that scrutiny effectively. Roberts sees a conservatism that is focused on the family. In this, he borrows from the old American right that recognized correctly, in my view, that cultural norms and attitudes matter. We should encourage our kids to get married and have kids. Oh, he's already talking about kids. Is he going to mention cat women? We'll see. We should teach them that marriage isn't just a contract, but a sacred and to the extent possible lifelong union. We should discourage them from behaviors that threaten the stability of their families, but we should also do something else. Create the material circumstances such that having a family isn't only for the privileged. That means better jobs at all levels of the income ladder. That means protecting American industries, even if it leads to higher consumer prices in the short term. That means listening to our young people who are telling us they can't afford to buy a home or start a family, not just criticizing them for a lack of virtue. Roberts is articulating a fundamentally Christian view of culture and economics, recognizing that virtue and material progress go hand in hand. So he's really trying to blend this sort of economic populism with Christian nationalism and theocracy. And that makes sense because that's the theme of the foreword that uh, Kevin Roberts wrote for Project 2025. And this idea that, you know, he's not associated with it is so much more difficult because of this book, which is why they delayed it. My childhood was was not, by any objective measure, easy. Neither was that of Kevin Roberts. Both of us were negatively impacted by family instability, and both of us were saved by the resilience of the thick network of family, grandparents, aunts, uncles, that is often the first and most effective component of our social safety net. Both of us saw how a factory leaving a town could destroy the economic stability that provided the foundation for those families, and both of us learned to love the country that gave both of us and our families second chances despite some bumps along the way. In these pages, Kevin is trying to figure out how we correcting uh how we preserve as much of what worked wait let me start that over i'm sorry this is a lot to read in these pages kevin is trying to figure out how we preserve as much of what worked in his own life while correcting what didn't to do that we need more than a politics that simply removes the bad policies of the past we need to rebuild we need an offensive we need an offensive conservatism not merely one that tries to prevent the left from doing things we don't like Here's an analogy I sometimes use to articulate what the previous generation of conservatives got right and wrong. Imagine a well-maintained garden in a patch of sunlight. It has some imperfections, of course, and many weeds. The very thing that makes it attractive for the things we try to cultivate makes it attractive for the things we don't. In an effort to eliminate the bad, a well-meaning gardener treats the garden with a chemical solution. This kills many of the weeds, but it also kills many of of the good things. Undeterred, the gardener keeps adding the solution. Eventually, the soil is inhospitable. In this analogy, modern liberalism is the gardener. The garden is our country. Oh, thank you for explaining this. And the voices discouraging the gardener were conservatives. We... <laughs> This is fucking stupid, I'm sorry. We were right, of course. In an effort to correct problems, some real, some imagined, we made a lot of mistakes as a country in the 1960s and 1970s. But to bring the garden back to health, it is not enough to undo the mistakes of the past. The garden needs not just to stop adding a terrible solution, but, uh, though it does need that, it needs to be recultivated. The old conservative movement argued, if you just got government out of the way, natural forces would resolve problems. We are no longer in this situation and must take a different approach. Okay. So, what he's calling for is the same paradigm shift that is recommended in Project 2025. So, this old libertarian idea of they believe in small government... I mean, we all know that that's not true because this has been a meme for a while, you know, government small enough to fit in your womb or in your bedroom. Um, so they're just saying, yeah, like, fuck it. Let's just not go with that libertarian mentality. Let's embrace Christian nationalism. That's the subtext here, right? So if you 
hear the pitch that Kevin Roberts makes in the forward of Project 2025, you know exactly where this is going. You know, it's no longer just trying to rebuild what conservatives lost and what policies we lost to liberals. It's trying to build something new, create a new type of conservatism for this new era. And Roberts has been very explicit about this. It's Christian nationalism. Uh, as Kevin Roberts writes, it's fine to take a laissez-faire approach when you are in the safety of the sunshine. But when the twilight descends and you hear the wolves, you've got to circle the wagons and load the muskets. Mm, interesting. We are now all realizing that it's time to circle the wagons and load the muskets in the fights that lay ahead. These ideas are an essential weapon. So it's not just that they want a new type of conservatism. Uh... It's that they are trying to do their very, very best to communicate that the country requires this new brand of conservatism because the country is falling apart. And the only way to save the country is to adopt Christian nationalism. That's, that's going to be the glue that holds it all together. So don't run away from these big government ideas like, you know, trying to dictate what women can and can't do with their bodies uh, you know, who you can and can't love, how you can identify. Don't run away from that. Embrace it. Embrace the authoritarianism. Embrace, uh, you know, the things uh, that people do in the privacy of their homes, like consuming porn. Ban that. Embrace the big government. Embrace authoritarianism. That's the pitch that Roberts is making. And the fact that J.D. Vance is uh, writing the foreword for this book, it's very incriminating. But I feel like none of this is... Uh, is new information because we already knew that Christian nationalism was the trajectory that this country was on. And they kind of view Trump as a vehicle for that. But if Trump loses in November, which I hope he does, um, it's not the end of this. Project 2025 is the start. They really want this to be a thing. They want to create a new Republican Party and remake it in the image of the Christian nationalist. And the fact that you have sitting members of Congress like Lauren Boebert and Marjorie Greene outright calling themselves Christian nationalists is very alarming. And I get that they're dumb, but as brain dead as some of these politicians are who self-identify as Christian nationalists, you have to understand that what they're saying is very serious. Because if you're a Christian nationalist, you are saying that the government is subservient to God. The Constitution, you know, that is going to come second to the Bible. Um, so it's, they're arguing effectively for theocracy. So these folks are sick, they're twisted and authoritarian, and we can't let them remake the Republican Party in that image. Like the Tea Party already kind of took over the Republican Party in a sense, and now they're all Tea Party. But if this happens with Christian nationalism, then for every election in the future, we have to worry about a Project 2025 sort of agenda because every subsequent Republican president is going to want to do Christian nationalism if this strain of authoritarianism in the party becomes mainstream so yeah just you've been warned but if you uh were curious what was in that forward that's what it is just kind of confirming what we already knew